welcome to the second in my lectures on cinema and the American avant-garde. Last time we were looking at Mary Ellen Butte's abstraction and we were starting to think about where she might fit in the history of the pre-Second World War avant-garde. We're picking up on that area of thinking again in this lecture on Maya Deren and where she is situated in the accepted inverted commas avant-garde history. I'd also like to look at different approaches to considering her work, her own philosophical writings on film, feminist engagements with her work and back to the notion of Darren as a feminist pioneer of avant-garde film. I'll try to touch on narrative as it is a developing issue that should become more interesting as we progress throughout these videos and it'd be good for you to think about it for yourself if you manage to track down and watch some of these films without me swaying you too much because it's something that is very subjective to every viewer and it's something that's really interesting to discuss if a group of different people have seen the same but a very different film each. First of all, before we do that, we'll just do a quick biography of Darren. Eleonora Derenkowski was born on the 29th of April 1917 in Kiev and she died on the 13th of October in 1961 in New York. Her parents escaped the threat of anti-Semitism by fleeing to New York in 1922, where they anglicised their name. They didn't really get on very well with each other and they were mostly split across the United States and Europe and Eleonora schooled in Geneva, for example. In the 1930s, as a young woman, Eleonora studied journalism and political science at Syracuse University, where she became active in student politics. She transferred to New York University where she was awarded her undergraduate degree in 1936 and in 1939 she completed a master's degree in English literature and symbolist poetry at Smith College. After college, Darren began working as an assistant to a famous dancer and choreographer, Catherine Dunham, and this gave her the opportunity to tour and perform across the United States. And she became a, a semi-professional dancer. And this is something that's going to link her with Shirley Clark, who we're going to look at in a few videos time. In 1941 in Los Angeles, Darren met Alexander Hamid, a Czechoslovakian filmmaker working in Hollywood, whom she collaborated with on her first film, Meshes of the Afternoon, in 1943. 1943 was a year of transformation for Darren. It was the year her father died, she returned to New York, she married Hamid, she transferred her primary focus from dance to film and she changed her first name to Maya. Buddhists understand Maya to mean illusion and in Sanskrit it translates as mother and in Greek mythology Maya is a messenger of the gods. So this is all very appropriate for an opinionated, politically minded, burgeoning filmmaker. Darren became interested in aspects of practice such as form and harmony, trying to find linkages between things, I suppose between similar forms across different modes of production, drawing in from her dance background. She was really interested in ritual and myth and voodoo practices. Like many artists on the modulus came from within this set of lectures, she was both a practitioner and a theorist of film. Unlike Butte, Darren is one of the canonic figures. She is recognised really widely as being part of the American avant-garde and a really established experimental filmmaker, almost to the point of legend, and not just for her film work and for being an artist, but also as a published philosopher. So there are many tensions between the persona of Maya Darren as a visionary hero of the arts and her rejection of the cult of personality iconic characters and signs of authorship in her work. For example, she withheld acting credits in her films and promoted them as collaborative arenas for shared and transferred experiences. And this is seen in Ritual and Transfigured Time, where her anonymous character and another are interchangeable. 
Bill Nichols, who is probably best known in film scholarship as somebody who writes about documentary. He's wrote many of the core textbooks on documentary and film studies, but he's also got interests in the avant-garde as well. Documentary and the avant-garde often collapse into one another. So Bill Nichols says that this refusal to engage with authorship allowed her to escape the fetishization of the signed, authenticated, original work of art in favour of mechanically reproducible works films whose function approximates that of unsigned collectively performed acts of magic, myth and ritual in other cultures. Here we might think of Marcel Duchamp's Ready Maids and again I know that the fountain I've learned since this that was an idea he probably nicked from a woman who came up with the idea of the Ready Maid first but that sort of thing and so the idea of also painting a moustache on the Mon- Mona Lisa and Walter Benjamin's work on um, the art and the age of mechanical reproduction and so on so they're changing notions of what constitutes this art at this point in the 20th century and importantly here as well what constitutes as an artist a person who makes these things or brings them into being Darren was somebody who promoted art, particularly the ethical dimension to its function. While her own art de-emphasises individual psychology in favour of ritual, so what humans do in unison and groupings. So Messages of the Afternoon, in its original incarnation it was completely silent, there was no soundtrack at all, but in 1959 so a good 16 years after it was made, Darren's third husband, TJ Ito, produced a score that was added. You should be able to pick up both versions, but I think that one with the score tends to be the one that's most prevalent out there. With the glory of technology, you can just mute the film and watch it in silence if you want. The very basic premise of it is that a woman who is played by Darren stops to pick up a flower from the ground as she's walking. She gets home and she falls asleep and then we see a series of dream sequences and involving these symbolic objects such as a flower, a key, a strange figure, a knife, a phone off the hook and that sort of thing. So it's a a series of quite strange occurrences and some violent occurrences as well. In the 1970s when P. Adams Sidney came to write the first edition of his seminal text visionary film specifically about the American avant-garde, Sidney cited Darren and Hamid's meshes in 1943 as what Ian Christie describes as quote a Colombian finding moment for American avant-garde film before tracing subsequent phases of activity under genres and forms, unquote. Some of the chapters in that book are later readings that I had set in the module. According to Bill Nichols, quote, Maya Darren did not contribute to an existing film movement, but galvanically launched a new one. Others preceded her, but only Maya Darren publicly and insistently proclaimed the need for a new art cinema, envisioned the conceptual and material means to build one, and actively saw to its implementation, unquote. We're already seeing perhaps why there is a significant contrast between two different pioneers of the avant-garde in the United States already. While we're on this, I'd like to put the views of these men scholars in contrast with the first reading I had set that week, which was an article by Teresa Geller claiming that Darren's filmmaking was a form of autobiography and it maps out Darren's battle, quote, against the dominant representations of women that were met with vehement resistance by a rapidly patriarchal and frequently misogynist avant-garde film culture, unquote. So when we look at the avant-garde through feminist eyes, the history gets a bit unpleasant and pretty messy. There are a lot of question marks and a lot of gaps that need to be redressed still. And interestingly, another wave of misogyny can be identified in the 1970s when structural filmmaking became a trend. With Geller, it is interesting that she suggests that Meshes exemplifies De Loretis' notion of, quote, the really 
really avant-garde work in cinema and in feminism that is narrative and Oedipal with a vengeance, unquote, pointing out the contradiction of the female subject here, a contradiction that, quote, historical women must work with and against, unquote. Geller's article, I think, makes for a compelling read and it counters wrongdoing from Sidney and Jonas Mackis, who was a significant theorist and practitioner whose work I would have loved to look at, but I couldn't access any of it, so I couldn't um, put it on the module. But it does neglect to examine Darren's own writing and I feel like that article indulges in more psychoanalytic reading of meshes, even if it was from a more feminist perspective of doing that. And because of the oneric or dreamlike qualities of Darren's films, particularly Mesh of the Afternoon and At Land, as well as when they were made in the 1940s, it's quite natural to analyse them through the guise of surrealist criticism and compare to, for example, En Chien Andalou, the Salvador Dali and Luis Bunuel film. And surrealism was, a, I think it's safe to say, it's pretty set in its place in the canon of experimentalism and modernism. And it seems to reside quite comfortably towards the start of historical discourse, historical maps of avant-garde film quite generally. And it's easy to situate Darren on a sort of fault line between you know, mid-war, say, European and post-war American avant-garde. So that 1920s to 40s area. And Darren wrote an article um, that was published on cinematography, which is indicative that she was incredibly knowledgeable about Europe's key avant-garde players so she's very aware of where she might be situated here I've been doing this for so long it feels actually quite boring and predictable to say that there are very strong links between surrealism and psychoanalysis so it's very easy to regard the props used in meshes as phallic or sexual symbols and symbols of power relating to that what I would say is that there is little or no overt sexualization in the film yet there is is an identifiable gender struggle and some mild eroticism might be felt and I think that might actually be contingent on what any given viewer brings to what they see. I would be wary of projecting onto the film. I think if you want to analyse it cold I think you need to be aware of what you're bringing with it and what you're projecting onto it yourself. So as an alternative to a psychoanalytic reading it might be appropriate to view Darren's work as studies on cinema's potential to distort or shift spatio-temporal reality. Darren does this through superimposition, recurring actions that are viewed from various angles and distances, that is points of view and even gazes. Also, there's a lot of slow motion she is playing with experiences of passing time and especially in ritual in transfigured time where there are instances of simultaneous real time and slow motion effects seeming to happen so she was really pushing the capabilities of the technology there in terms of cinematography and editing what they were capable of doing to our lived experience of passing time and more importantly, Darren was really anti-Freud and in a sense, therefore, she was anti-surrealist. She didn't personally accept psychoanalysis as a form of film interpretation and criticism and she preferred to challenge film form rather than a film's story or its concept. She wasn't interested in narrative. She used narrative techniques to a point but they were a vehicle to exploring time and space and what film could do with time and space. So like Gilles Deleuze, Darren saw film as a visual, temporal, spatial art form. I'll return to Deleuze in a moment when considering form. I just wanted to spend a bit of time with Darren's stance against psychoanalysis. So from her anagram, section 1b, which combines the state of nature and character of the human with the nature of forms, to quote from her, 
Above all, the ritualistic form treats the human being not as the source of the dramatic action, but as a somewhat depersonalised element in a dramatic whole. The intent of such depersonalization is not the destruction of the individual. On the contrary, it enlarges him beyond the personal dimension and frees him from the specializations and confines of personality. He becomes part of a dynamic whole, which, like all such creative relationships, in turn endow its parts with a measure of its larger meaning. Later, Darren asserts in this text that artists do not express the self through symbols because of deep-seated anxieties as prescribed by the likes of Freud. Writing in 1946, she questions, quote, the current tendency to regard all the images of a work in terms of Freudian symbolic reference. Unquote. This is at a time when Freudian interpretation was being liberally applied to all sorts of things, so film, art, dreams of course. It's really quite interesting to see somebody pushing against that and getting really quite fed up that everything's boiled down and reduced to the sorts of ideas that Freud and, and Freudian philosophers and scholars and um, psychologists were buying into. Darren's argument, I find it's really convincing when she asserts that, quote, a competent artist intent on conveying some sexual reference will find a thousand ways to evade censorship and make his, and she is of course using the standard male in her writing here, make his meaning irrevocably clear, unquote. In a scathing, affirming comment, she continues, quote, even the incompetence in Hollywood daily achieve this. Should we deny at least a similar skill in our more serious artists? Unquote. She's really posing a challenge here and she's being a bit rude really about people working in Hollywood and saying like they're very easily finding ways. I keep thinking of the walls of Jericho in um, It Happened One Night, that sort of thing where there are very clear references to sex but when Hollywood gets to the point where the Hayes Code is in place and there are very conservative politics at play but filmmakers have to become more and more resourceful at communicating communicating that these characters have had sex or these characters want to have sex with each other you know that sort of thing so she's getting at that really she's just pointing out how banal it is that oh, oh okay in the mouth oh how sexual you know it's a bit it's just a bit too on the nose and that maybe trust creatives to have a bit more wit than that I think is really what she's getting at there Throughout the anagram, Darren reiterates her belief that art and cinema are greater than individuals' artistic expressions. As her films progress, she became increasingly infatuated with both experimentation with the form of film and her personal interest in collaborative dance and ritual, so bodies working together and performing acts together. For this reason, it is quite difficult to situate her filmmaking and really put clear labels on it. Is her work psychodrama? It's been called psychodrama quite a lot. Are they trance films? Is she an American surrealist as opposed to a European surrealist? She's definitely anti-Hollywood and she makes this really clear in Anagram. We can grapple with that question of classification a bit later on, but what else is clear in Anagram are similarities between her writing about film with that of philosophers who would come along much later than her, specifically Gilles Deleuze in France. They both disregarded psychoanalysis and film criticism. They believed that film is a thought-generating organism. They felt that parallels can be drawn between their notions of parts and wholes. And they used different metaphors here to get at essentially the same point, that is Darren's mechanical machine and Deleuze's glass of water. As an example, I'll focus on Monday. In his section on mobility, Deleuze informs us that images are united through movement or unity that expresses the changes to the whole throughout a film and determines the displacement of parts from one set to another. For example, unity is expressed because of and within montage editing. 
that can be seen in the sequence that's pictured on the screen in Darren's At Land from 1944. A mysterious woman, played by Darren, emerges from a sea that is ebbing and flowing backwards. So the idea is that she's washed ashore, she crawls along the beach, she finds driftwood, she begins to climb up it. It becomes more structured and polished as she climbs. When she reaches the top, it cuts to her hands appearing on a dining table and she climbs up on the dining table and crawls along the dining table. When you see at land, Darren's actions coupled with the camera's different movements and the edits between these different movements, they provide the unity between parts or takes, okay, blocks of film time, and they do this across the whole film. Deleuze explains that in theory, the filmic whole should be one continuous shot, that is one long take. Just to point out, this was quite an advanced class. These were final year students I was teaching so I didn't really have to go into these explanations and I will do my basics of film language at some point. Just quickly, a shot is distinct from a take in that a take is the time between cuts, the time between edits, whereas a shot is a close-up, a medium shot, a long shot. And you can have all of those different shots within one take because if there's no cut and the camera is moving around from it cuts in until it cuts out, that's a take. Okay, just a very quick way of explaining that. Deleuze is saying that the film McCall should be one continuous shot, so a long take, and that separate parts would be unconnected, discontinuous shots, and he states that the whole must become the synthetic whole of the film, which is realised in the montage of the parts, and conversely, the parts must be selected, coordinated, enter into connections and liaisons, which through montage reconstitute the virtual sequence shot or the analytic whole of the cinema, unquote. And that was from Deleuze's Cinema One book, The Movement Image, page 27. A rare reference or something here. So according to Deleuze, carefully edited montage is vital to providing the correct unity to a film. And Deleuze carries on by stating that, quote, false continuities are an essential pole of the cinema, unquote, that appear either within sets or during the transition between sets, that is, between sequence shots. He adds, quote, far from breaking up the whole, false continuities are the act of the whole, the hallmark that they impress on sets and their parts, unquote. And that's in page 28 of that book. So at this part in the original lecture, I played a clip of a study in choreography for camera. So if you want, you could pause this and go and search for a study in choreography for camera in 1945 and have a look at it. It's only a few minutes long, the whole thing, I think. So if we look at a study in choreography for camera to perhaps visualise or exemplify Deleuze's notion of false continuities, similarly to Darren's edited movements in that land, the dancer Tally Beatty's motions appear smooth and unaffected by the frequent change in location. They're being transposed in place and time. They all look like they're taking place in a homogenous time, but spatially they're different if that makes sense. Like Darren in the earlier film, his spatial reality does not affect his performance. He carries on oblivious to his shifting surroundings, whereas her character notices the shift from exterior isolation to a populated interior in that land. False continuities are the set of the whole and realise what Deleuze calls, quote, the other power of the out of field, unquote, that is off-screen space. Now, because of Darren's anagram, many theorists, including Catherine Fowler, discuss Darren in terms of vertical versus horizontal filmmaking. And we can link this back to Deleuze as well. His movement image theory is directed more at classical pre-Second World War film. Horizontal deals only with space-time. Darren's films begin at a transition period between what we think of in historiographical terms 
Germans as the thresholds of pre-1945 and post-war periods. Darren's films take us somewhere beyond simple notions of space and time, inverting them to the point where her images and imagery provoke thought and therefore they become time images or duration images and thus equate her own and Deleuze's notion of the vertical. Darren's is a cinema of thought and as such is certainly modernist and beyond that classification remains difficult. But we'll take a a look at another way of attempting to place a label on that. Another tension with the content and themes in her art is her legacy as a feminist pioneer and entrepreneur. Her individuality here is perhaps more comfortable with a commodity art market, both creating and relying upon individual reputations. Darren inserted herself into the boys club. She was not separate. She did not create a feminist alternative, at least not in the filmmaking fray, you know, in her personal life life perhaps a bit more but not in her practice. She was a woman who actively fought for space in a man's world. Now how that is interpreted changes according to who you read. So with Bill Nichols quote Darren defies categories unquote she did not comply to a construct of femininity. It's interesting because I think if you look back and you read her biography in a way she does there's a bohemian kind of femininity that is probably I think because it's people don't bat an eyelid about that version of femininity anymore but back then at this time in the 1940s say when women had to be a specific thing she absolutely didn't. She was very free very um, what we think of as bohemian was incredibly radical back then. She also wasn't feminist in the modern sense, you know, today's sense either. She wasn't individualistic in a promotion of her own art, but instead she drove forward the common cause of a necessary new art cinema. It wasn't really about her name and about her being a great artist. It, it was about the work, really. She ends up in a way becoming a myth or a legend because she was driving this. The stories about her become really prevalent rather than her stories if that makes sense. She wanted the characters in her films and not just the characters that she herself played and performed. All of them she wanted them to be seen as distinct from Maya Darren the artist. They were not her, they were not biographical. Her writings are concerned with film as an art form that is produced with the technology and even talks about the quote, closed circuits of the photographic process, unquote, in 1960. She does not use her texts as feminist clarion calls, but by seeing herself as equal and conducting herself accordingly, she is feminist. She's just not, I suppose, actively being feminist. She's being egalitarian and being a person, being a practitioner. Anagram also mentions realism in photography and documentary, on which Darren expands in depth in her 1960 article, published not long before her death at just 44 of multiple brain hemorrhages. It would be worth looking at each of these texts in more depth if you ever get your hands on them, and especially before having a look at Stan Brackage's work in the next session as some scholars identify a definite influence from her work in his work. I just want to round this up with the question of placement in the canon, which is going to remain a question because I don't have any answers. Annette Mickelson is another name that cropped up throughout the readings on this module. Mickelson set out to engage with Darren's anagram, but before doing so, depicts in detail in her work the maleness surrounding Darren in avant-garde practices and discourses of the time, which really were one and the same in the 1940s and 1950s, all of which was happening beyond academia. It is from this position that Mickelson discusses the anagram, which she almost affectionately calls, quote, the product of a brilliant bricolage accomplished within the general framework of a modernist aesthetic, unquote. And so we're circling back again to the breadth and relative safety of modernism again. To sum up, The main concerns so far, we've been thinking 
about really posing questions around the avant-garde canon and how that is formed. So thinking about who is included, whose work is included and excluded and why. Another question is, to what extent should we regard Darren as a feminist pioneer? Is it enough to be doing it anyway as a woman in such a thoroughly male domain? Because this was somebody who was concerned with pushing the technology and didn't have an explicitly feminist agenda. Is that still somebody who can be considered as a feminist pioneer? Another question is how might we apply her own theoretical writings to our general understanding of film? Does it help us have access to another way of thinking about film practice and about film form and film as a medium? And then how might we apply others' theory and scholarship to Darren's films is it useful to combine the two I mean it's always useful to get breadth and depth in these things anyway also to question is it possible to classify her films into a given type how do you define the parameters of that type or that genre or subgenre or whatever it is and should we should we just leave them alone can we leave things unclassified and uncategorized because it's film it's cinema it's art does it need to be rendered down even more than that can it be more fluid than that there's quite a lot to chew on there and I'd really recommend if you can see Darren's work there is quite a lot on YouTube but I can't verify how legal any of those videos are I would be quite discerning about that but I would watch whatever you can and really give it a go because I think if you take on board some of those ideas that really this is somebody who is experimenting with what the technology associated with the particular media can be capable of and what it can be used to do to our perceptions of space and time and I will leave you with that thank you so much for listening as ever if you would like to support my work it would be hugely appreciated and you can make a a one-off payment or sign up for a membership at buymeacoffee.com forward slash PEA Blair and the link for that will be down below in the show notes I also make a podcast called Audiovisual Cultures it would be great if you could subscribe and listen to that as well and you'll get a lot more in-depth analysis of specific works as well as interviews with practitioners and scholars and it's good crack all around thanks very much and see you in the next one